And Mike, you're good to go. Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome. I would like to call the meeting to order. It is 9.17 a.m. Uh, Stephanie, can you please take attendance? Of course. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Ava Bermuda Zimmerman. Present. Ellen McKitterick. Present. Um, Alice Pritchard would not be joining us today. Mike Soltis. Here. And Holly Williams. Present. All right, we have a quorum. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. I'd like to welcome and thank the members of the public for joining us this morning. Um, I'd like to ask the committee for a review of the June 6, 2023 minutes and a motion to approve those minutes. I'll make a motion to approve. I have a second. second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Um, moving to our next item. Um, Discussion about private plan policy revisions. Joe, would you please lead the discussion on the potential revisions to the private plan policy? Yep, absolutely. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, just give me one second. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. So today's discussion about the private plans, um, we've made some changes to the private plan policy, or at least we would like to make some changes to the private plan uh, procedures and policy document. Uh, Michael sent it out um, yesterday in the afternoon. Um, so today I just wanted to summarize kind of what those changes are, what they look like, and then next steps in terms of a review. So um, major changes are gonna be more structural, also some provisional changes. And just a reminder, the next uh, policy and procedures meeting uh, is Tuesday, August 1st. Hmm. All right, so in terms of structure changes, um, the policy and procedures document previously or in its current form, let's say, um, in terms of flow, it's more, you know, there was a lot of uh, discussion on interim period. There was a lot of discussion on what happens after the prior, uh, the plan approval, the voting was its own section. So we decided to make some changes related to how it flows. So essentially the document flows as one would apply for the plan. So general provisions, what kind of plans exist. Um, this is typically insured or self-insured plans. The application process is the next section. So anyone reading it is gonna feel more like a manual now versus um, a policy and procedures document where they're looking for different provisions in different parts of the, the document. Uh, active private plan. So, you know, your responsibilities once the plan is approved. Um, termination of the private plan. This section always existed. Um, it's been beefed up um, to discuss changes um, once the renewal period or once the effective date period is is complete. So typically we approve private plans for three years. Uh, what happens after that? You kind of go back to the top where it's the application process again. If you want to go with another private plan for another uh, term, it doesn't have to necessarily be three years, but typically one, two or three years. Um, or if you'd like to leave the private plan and, uh, and return back to the public plan, there's more language surrounding that um, and what the requirements are there. And then the last section um, is pretty much the same with some changes, but that would be the exhibit section. Any questions on this part? So provision changes or major provision changes, uh, interim period. Uh, so we eliminated the references to those. Uh, the interim period was period 
before the full policy procedure document was, um, I suppose, ratified or when it was approved. Um, so that's that 12-1, uh, 2021 period. And then we went live, 1-1-22. So all language referring to the interim period has been eliminated, which should um, make it simpler to read for sure, um, since it's really not applicable to anyone right now. In terms of the vote, we added some language related to when the vote should occur. Um, this is kind of a twofold potential issue that, that we're seeing. Um, so the first part is you, you have the employees vote on a private plan and then you don't apply for that plan for a year, right? Uh, so we're seeing some delay between when the employees actually voted for the private plan versus when the effective date of the private plan is. So trying to put some guidelines as to if you have that vote, you know, within six months of the actual effective date seems to make the most sense. At least that'll give the um, employer some time to gather the rest of the materials actually apply to the authority, but also not have so much time go by that the vote was for something that happens way too far into the future. Uh, similarly, when a plan, the effective date begins, so let's say the plan starts on 1-1 one, one, um, and it's a three-year term, not to have a vote right away in that first year of the private plan to say, um, to vote for a new private plan three years later. So again, trying to at least put some guidelines as to when the vote has to occur for the new effective date of the plan. In terms of uh, applying for a private plan, we added some language just to beef up when, um, when it needs to be approved and submitted or submitted and approved by the authority. Uh, so we always had language in there that basically 31 days prior to the effective date, that's when it needs to be submitted and approved by the authority. We added more guidelines and timelines as to when those actual dates are uh, to make it a little easier for the employers or for the TPAs um, to see when all private plan documentation needs to be submitted and then ultimately approved uh, for the new effective date. Uh, for contributions, we added some clarity as to when contributions are due. Um, also some clarity about contributions needing to be paid in full prior to the effective date or at times uh, within a month of the effective date of the private plan. Uh, so what we're seeing is some overlap at times where, you know, they come back to the, let's say they come back to the public plan, or rather they're moving to a private plan, um, but they still owe contributions to the public plan through the last quarter of let's say 2022, for example. Um, so giving some guidance as to when, as to those contributions needing to be due and then ultimately, um, that could be a cause for denial for the private plan if they're not uh, paying, paid in full. So basically keeping track of where the contributions are going and then ultimately um, how they're going to allocate those for the private plans later. There's also another interesting issue related to this, which is um, what looks to be double contributions. So continuing to pay the public plan while also having a private plan at the same time, this causes a lot of work for the authority in terms of um, the financial team organizing it and ultimately redistributing those funds back to the employer. And then the employer needs to redistribute those funds back to the employee since it's employee money. Uh, we beefed up the language there in order to add penalties related to this because we're seeing this quite often um, and it's become a bit of an issue. So again, trying to put on the employer a little bit more responsibility on the financial aspect or on the TPAs on the financial aspect um, and making sure that the contributions are to date and they're appropriate based on whether the employer is paying them, whether the employee is paying them. Uh, contacts, we added some language that, you know, within 31 days of a change with the employer, they need to update the contacts. Um, through Salesforce, we're having some issues. We've gone through this through the annual report this year where we're sending out um, emails uh, to folks that may or may not be 
part of the company anymore. Um, this is creating a bit of is an issue if we need to contact some of these employers related to plan issues or renewals. So we wanted to add some language there to make sure that the employer knows they need to keep us up to date with uh, the contacts. Annual reports, this isn't really new language, may first existed in there as well uh, already, but wanted to emphasize this um, going forward. I think this year we told employers uh, May 15th was the due date. Uh, we didn't receive necessarily all the annual reports. There was some missing, um, but wanted to emphasize this for next year since those annual reports um, are a little bit tedious. We do need time to, you know, get the report all together um, and really wanted to emphasize May 1st as a due date that will give the authority enough time to create the report. Um, and it also should give um, carriers and employers enough time um, to get the reports for the prior year. In terms of returning to the public plan, this language existed as well, but uh, 90 days notice required, um, again, in terms of that language, we emphasized it a little bit more, added some more clarity as to the process. Um, so filling out a form, notifying us 90 days uh, prior. Um, there's also, you know, when we think about that language, we need to think about um, if they're returning to the public plan, they need to give us notice. But if they want to renew the private plan, they really need to think about the timeline as it relates to uh, getting the vote again, um, getting the documents, applying through the authority. So that's still due December 1st for, for the new year, uh, but they really need to get everything together prior to that in case, for example, if uh, the employees vote no, then they still need to notify us going forward that they're coming back to a public plan because they don't have approved uh, private plan going forward. Uh, we changed the language to the denials a little bit. Uh, essentially, for the renewal of private plans, we're looking back at prior performance of the private plans to figure out um, if they've been compliant. So this has to deal with annual reports, contributions, um, not having kind of all your ducks in a row there um, could lead to a denial of the plan. So we added language related to that, um, that essentially an employer may be denied simply because they haven't been abiding by the uh, private planning procedures uh, document and their requirements for having a private plan. For the plain language document, this is a exhibit two in this document. Uh, we added a who's the claims administrator. Uh, this adds clarity to the employee to know essentially is it a TPA, is it the employer who's going to um, be administering the plan just so they know in advance. Um, also, we added language related to defining 12 months. So typically we see most employers use a rolling back 12 months. So uh, whenever uh, somebody goes out on disability or goes out on leave, uh, the 12 month clock really starts there. So they look back to that effective date. Some employers use calendar months. So based on the definition by statute, we just added those there as options um, so that the employee also knows uh, what, what the what the employer is using as the the twelve month period to define uh, when they can go out on a benefit. So that's pretty much in a nutshell the major changes. Uh, there's also changes related to just um, corrections and um, really some language, uh, but nothing major, nothing that switches the intent outside of these major provision. So I'll pause there. Any any questions with what I discussed thus far? No? Joe, I have a few questions. Uh, yes. Number one, thank you for your presentation. Um, number, I would imagine as we are now doing private plan audits, mm -hmm. we are going to um, at least for the first couple of years, continually find issues that uh, belong in this policy document. And as we see with this um, proposed change, it takes a number of months to go from, we should change this to the change being implemented. So at least internally, 
I would think, and I'm wondering uh, what you guys think. Maybe we should be revisiting this annually, with, you know, with the plan to make uh, to update annually, because otherwise it could be a continuous process. Yeah, so I think some of the changes we're recommending here are directly related to some of the audits we've been doing. Um, just things we were finding, particularly, for example, the um, the voting, right? That that kind of came out of um, audits as well, and and thinking about you know what's the time frame between the effective date and when the employees actually voted for the plan. Um, so we're keeping track of those changes, and then I think yes, the goal here is to really review this this document annually and make changes um, as needed going forward. Um, I don't know, Michael or Aaron. Uh, if you agree or disagree, but I, I think that's the plan ultimately. I, I agree. I love the comment, Mike. I actually was nervous the opposite, that you would be tired of seeing this document and tired of us making revisions to it. <laughs> so the idea of doing an annual review, I could not agree more. Yeah. I think that's that's right, as we sort of learn and grow yeah. and, and realize what, mm -hmm. both what we didn't address or what maybe employers or TPAs are confused by. All right. All right my other and last observation is, um, you you mentioned the uh, annual plan that needs to be filed uh, in May, and it I'm I'm curious other than reviewing the plan for basic compliance, are there any other metrics used to evaluate the plans based on those reports? Yes, or I mean, it's 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 the main reason why we we required the report at first was that we have our own annual report requirement, the, the report that I think we're going to issue publicly in three or four days. Uh, I know we're sort mm -hmm. of preparing for that. Part of that, is, or the reports about the overall program, you know, and doesn't carve out private plans from that annual report. So we want to make sure that we got information from the private plans that we could then use to include in the yeah. report. Because that's part of the status of the the program overall. So that was sort of the main thrust of it. Now that we have the reports, um, there's some details in there about contributions that are being taken, about claims being paid, and we're going to be reviewing them and then figuring out is this telling us something that we need to look closer into? You know, mm. obviously, if someone's withholding more than 0.5 percent, that's I think that means an audit's probably coming and, and making sure that that's was that an error? Was there a typo? Or did you, are you truly withholding more than you're supposed to? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of information in those reports that we haven't at this point sort of dove too deeply into, but is available. Um, mm -hmm. If we're seeing a high denial rate, you know, 90% mm -hmm. of claims are being denied by a certain employer, that could be accurate. It could be valid. That maybe mm -hmm. truly are a lot of inappropriate claims, but that certainly is a trigger or a flag to say, maybe we need to look a bit closer at this. Um, yeah. We haven't sort of implemented any official policies related to it, but it certainly isn't on our uh, on the horizon. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments for Joe or Mike? Okay, thank you once again, Joe, for your presentation. Appreciate no it. Problem. All right, let's move on to um, discussion about the, uh, resolution regarding signatory authority and Michael will lead us in that discussion. Thank you, Mike, and good morning, everybody. Um, so as the committee may remember, last month we had a conversation about um, the temporary delegation of the CEO's signatory authority. Um, sort of thinking back to when Andrea was CEO and she was out for a couple of weeks and the board had to officially sort of grant Aaron the ability to sign on behalf of the authority, basically pay bills and keep the authority running. Um, we talked about how that's probably not the best way to approach this, requiring the board to get together, have a meeting, have a quorum, and potentially have, if that doesn't occur, not have someone uh, who's able to sign on behalf of the authority uh, and sort of keep us afloat and, and running. So we talked about having the ability of um, the CEO to temporarily delegate, if they know they're going to be absent, delegate that authority to somebody else at, at the, I, I delegate that power to somebody at the authority. I say authority too many times here. They, they delegate that power to somebody at the authority um, while, while the CEO is absent. What the bylaws allow it, but what the bylaws require is a resolution granting the CEO the power to grant that delegation. So we had, dra we had drafted the resolution that I shared with everyone yesterday. Um, 
one I'm going to share it on the screen and sort of walk through quickly. One thing we realized as we worked through the process is that we had a couple of resolutions, maybe three to five um, hmm. previously, that had granted various levels of authority. Um, they were in different places. We realized that's probably not the most efficient way to do this, having separate delegations of authority. So with this approach, we sort of tried to combine it, them all into one, um, hmm. at least all the, the sort of ongoing delegations. Um, so it's a little bit longer than it has to be, but we feel like in you know six months from now, if someone ever asks who has the ability to sign for this payment that's worth $7,000 that's budgeted, we can find it all in one place. Who are the people who can sign on behalf of the authority? So I'm going to walk really quickly through this. Um, some things you may have seen before when we adopt the original resolution, but a couple of the items are new. The whereas, that's all the ability to grant this authority in the resolution. This paragraph is has always existed. This is essentially saying that both the chairperson of the board and the CEO have the ability to sign. They can sign for any non-budget items up to $5,000 or any budgeted items no matter the cost, as well as sign in order to set up bank accounts or MOUs with other state agencies. So that's always existed. Just reaffirming that. These next two paragraphs, this is the sort of the new language about this temporary de delegation of authority. Um, essentially, this first paragraph says that the CEO has the ability to delegate to another employee of the authority all the powers that are in this first paragraph. And then this second paragraph is essentially putting the parameters about that delegation. Um, it's meant to be temporary. Um, so it's to another employee of the authority, making it clear it has to be a management employee of the authority. Um, the timelines, the start date is as of the effective date um, of the incapacity or absence. Uh, along with a notice requirement to the board. Uh, and then the expiration date of this authority is, um, the expiration date of this delegation is when the CEO returns or if the board rescinds that delegation. I'm gonna circle back to the timelines in a second. I just wanna sort of walk through the rest of the resolution. The This next paragraph, this is has already existed. This is the ability of the controller to sign, up, sign for any um, budget expenses that are less than $5,000. So. Sort of to recap, the CEO and chairperson can sign off on any budget items, no matter the cost, or any non-budget items that are less than 5000 The controller and the finance team can sign off on any budget items less than 5000 That's sort of the permanent ongoing uh, resolution. And then this last section is the ability of the officers of the board to certify that the delegation is accurate. So that's basically it. Circling back to the timelines. We were having conversations internally about whether this should be sort of a end date to the delegation because it's meant to be temporary. And we really, this is intended to be, a, you know, usurping the board's ability to decide who gets assigned on behalf of them. It's not a way to go around the board. It's really meant to address those situations where the board isn't able to approve, can't have a meeting, doesn't have a quorum to officially grant that delegation. So the idea was it's temporary. And then the board can decide if they want to to rescind it. Um, we wanted we didn't want to risk a situation where we had bills to pay and you know maybe Fran wasn't available and the board couldn't get a quorum to meet to officially grant someone else that power. So sort of we balanced those two options of having a strict timeline versus having a sort of more open ended. And we, and we ended up with this language, but I did want to sort of highlight that and see what the committee felt about that. Um, so that's basically it. I'll stop sharing um, to figure out how to. Oh, there, stop share. All right. Uh, any questions about the timelines, the resolution in general, signatory authority in general? Happy to address them. All right. Any questions or comments? Well, Michael, I have a few. Okay. <laughs> so, so number one, um, this obviously deals with a planned absence as opposed to an unplanned absence, mm -hmm. right? So is there a plan? What's the plan for an unplanned absence? Yeah, great question. I mean, obviously the chairperson still has the ability to sign on behalf of the authority. Um, so Fran at this, at this time would be able to, that would be sort of the emergency at this time. We can certainly explore other options. Um, if we want to sort of have a uh, 
delegate in waiting um, that Aaron just sort of has on deck. That wasn't what we talked about, or we didn't sort of agree to that last month, but we're happy to explore it if you think that's the way to go or any other options. Well, I think we should have some process mm -hmm. in place. I haven't, I don't know what it should be, but I think we should have a process in place for uh, mm -hmm. um, an unplanned absence. Um, so I'm sorry, Mike, can I just respond to sure. that? So one thing we did talk about last month was um, particularly with a team as we're still pretty small. Um, if the if the pre-designated number two person also happens to be out, you're still sort of stuck in this situation. Um, and so, you know, and we we don't want to sort of a repeat of Al Haig kind of taking control of the government. Um, and thank you for knowing who that was. I kind of <laughs> like you know, all the blank faces of all these people who who weren't around then. Um, so I think right now the idea was the chairperson has sort of that ability to sort of immediately take over the reins, and then if need if. If the unplanned absence ends up being longer than a couple of days, then the chairperson could call a board meeting and the board could act mm -hmm. to appoint somebody. So I think mm -hmm. that is effectively the plan for an extended unplanned absence. Mm -hmm. um, we could certainly identify a different plan, but that's kind of what we were thinking because we wanted to. We're always going to need to have a fail safe for if the person who is identified isn't around. Mm -hmm. um, so that's right. kind of the, the thought process there. Okay. So maybe we don't need a specific policy on an unplanned absence because what's in place now is the board would get together and, and do something. Right. Okay. Um, two other things. What is What is the maximum leave that... Uh, our executive director could have. I mean, if we're talking about a planned leave, and certainly, um, you know, we talk about a couple of days, we talk about 12 weeks even, somebody says, I'm going to be out for four months. Do we have um, in our personnel policies a maximum leave? Um, not exactly. We have in our personnel policies the sort of recognition that our staff are covered by Connecticut and federal, potentially federal FMLA, and that they uh, are covered by the State Personnel Act with regard to accruals. So um, in the state of Connecticut, if you are a managerial employee, you accrue 10 hours of sick time and 10 hours of vacation time per month. Um, I am a longtime state employee. I have a fair amount of accruals personally. Mm -hmm. um, it is theoretically possible that I, I actually haven't checked um, if my accruals exceed 12 weeks. I don't remember if they do or not. They're, they're pretty darn close. Mm -hmm. I don't take a lot of time. Um, you know, I may not always be the CEO. There may be a CEO who's brand new to state government and won't have any accruals. Um, there could be someone who's even more senior and has even more accruals than I do. So mm -hmm. I think there's no true maximum. Um, yeah. I think the, the idea behind this resolution is to say, literally, not literally, because I'm about to use the metaphor of picking up the reins. You know, we've got a runaway carriage. We need someone to take up the reins of the mm -hmm. horses, get the carriage to stop safely. Okay, now you've got breathing room. Now, board, you mm -hmm. need to act. If it really mm -hmm. is just for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, we can do a temporary delegation. Um, if it's going to be longer than that, I think the board needs to act. So, one of the questions is Does the board want a hard and fast deadline on the duration of a CEO's temporary delegation to someone else. If I know that I'm going to be in, um, I think Mike used the idea, the argument of Uzbekistan. I don't want to go to Uzbekistan, but if I have to go to Uzbekistan for two weeks, 
Hmm. I can delegate somebody. If I have to be there for three weeks, do you want me to still be able to delegate or do I, does the board, does that give the board enough time to convene mm -hmm. and identify? Hmm. Um, the board is generally very responsive, but it is tricky sometimes to get a quorum of the board together. Right. Everyone is really, really busy. So we just, we're trying to figure out the best balance for, is it, um, do we leave it kind of, open-ended with the board having the absolute ability to meet if they don't like the person I delegated and you want to meet within three days, great. Mm -hmm. If you're okay with it and you're welcome mm -hmm. to have it be two and a half weeks, mm -hmm. you know, right now that it gives the board that authority, um, but we could add in a specific time frame if you wanted to. But no, I'm not, I, I'm not suggesting that. I was just thinking about the possibilities. Um, mm -hmm. And as far as, um, at least for one person's view, our board meets monthly. So the most the, the, the most time that would pass would be a month before the board has an opportunity to revisit. I mean, it, yeah. and it could be as little as a week or two or three. So I'm comfortable with that um, okay. for me, but... <laughs> <laughs> My, my last comment. So um, in the resolve further, there's a reference to a management position. And I went back and I looked at our org chart. And I see we have a number of manage, managers with the, that word in their title, whether it's IT solutions, Salesforce tech manager, vendor performance manager, engagement manager, and somehow I would be thinking that the delegation would be to one of the executive director's direct reports rather than a manager who might report um, to the direct report and wondered if there's a better way, if that's the intention, if there's a better yeah. way to describe it. Um, good point. I will say um, that is certainly kind of the expectation. We were thinking manager, not necessarily based on title, but <laughs> the way the state works, um, the best way to know if someone's a manager or not is you look at their pay plan. Um, it's an MP pay plan, your manager, potentially a VR pay plan. Um, I don't think we have anybody in the EX pay plan, but there are specific, there are, there are specific pay plans in state government that sort of is where you look to figure out if someone's considered to be managerial mm -hmm. versus um, bargaining unit. And so that tends to be that proxy. We could reframe it to say um, a direct report, you know, to, to one of the CEO's direct reports or, you know, we, we kind of, we're going back and forth. It's like, we don't even call our, we don't even necessarily have a single word for senior staff. We've got the senior staff, the executive staff, mm -hmm. division leads. I think we're a little loose in terms of how we refer to that. Yeah, well, that's that, what I mean. I wrote leadership. down executive team or department head. And then finally, I thought maybe direct report yeah. uh, or, or a manager who was a direct report, some, something like that yeah. would. I think that's a, you know we're talking about one two three four five people right um, yeah there's there's six but yeah six, yeah so um, uh, we yeah I think that's a good point to say to a manager who is a direct report of the CEO yeah that that provides a little bit more um, clarity and there's still a fair number of, of right. people right. <laughs> hopefully somebody would survive. In that situation, we'll try not to all take the same plane together. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments about the um, resolution? Um, I had a question for Aaron. Typically, Aaron, in other state agencies, what's the maximum that that proxy could be be allowed? So right now in our bylaws, it says and in the document 5000, is that the, the usual amount? So the... Um, unbudgeted amount of up to 5,000 is actually in the statute. It, it, nobody, none of us can 
spend any money, any, any unbudgeted funds of more than 5,000 without direct board action. So that's why that, that number is still in there. Um, in terms of how state agencies handle delegations, in my experience, um, it, well, most state agencies have a deputy commissioner. So the deputy commissioner, one or more deputy commissioners. So a deputy commissioner basically can be appointed to have whatever authority the commissioner has. Um, but in terms of standing delegations, I, in, in Holly, um, I'm, you may know better than I, but I haven't seen any any real directives other than just sort of common sense and good judgment. So I know at DAS, because we were the contracting agency, the director of the procurement office had delegation of, up to like millions of dollars. <laughs> um, you know, so it, it really just sort of depended on the needs of the agency. Yeah, I mean, and I would just add that the ability you know, we really get into the delegation when we're delegating outside of an agency or something that would be contrary to what the legislative intent is or what is otherwise provided in statute. Um, but I'm not aware of anything that's more specific than what Karen's outlined. I mean, excuse me, what Aaron's outlined. Okay, any other questions, comments? And the resolution. All right, hearing none, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Much appreciated. Let's uh, move on to uh, old business. Is there any old business anyone would like to discuss? Okay, hearing nothing, we'll move on to new business. Any new business anyone would like to discuss? All right, we will then move to our final item. Um, I have a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Eva. A second? Second. Okay, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. It is 9.54 a.m. Thanks everyone for your time this morning. Have a good Thank rest you, of the everyone. day. Thank you. Bye. Have a good week.